this is the Thursday afternoon continuation uh, meetings of the House Appropriations Committee. And I just have one quick uh, housekeeping uh, for, my, for our committee, the Appropriations Committee. We will be meeting on Monday. And so at the end of this, make sure we don't sign off before understanding a few things that will be happening on Monday. But for now, we are happy to have uh, joining us the House Government Operations Committee. We have the um, <clears throat> Department of Public Safety budget before us, and we have Commissioner Sherling. I see uh, your name. I don't see you. I'm hoping you'll be able to pop on. And we have um, your Deputy Commissioner, uh, Chris Herrick. Nice to see you. And I will let you introduce the rest of your team. And what I want to just tell um, the Committee of Jurisdiction that is joining us that what we are considering uh, with, the, with the administration's proposal is a full year budget. And it's based off the uh, 21 budget as proposed in January. And so much of the information that you'll see before you is just the differences that were made from the governor's proposal in January. And so it's important as we go through, if you do not see an initiative or any change in the ups and downs that you know have happened, it means that it's still on the table if it was proposed in January. These are just showing the things that are still in but may have been uh, changed uh, or things that have been completely, that have been completely eliminated or uh, completely new initiatives. And so it, it's a bit more complicated, but we are going to be able to sort our way through this um, quickly. We're on a very quick timeline. Um, I'm going to ask that the committees of jurisdiction reply in an informal email to us, very informal about things that they agree, don't agree, or would change by January, January, <laughs> I'm way out of touch here, uh, by September uh, 1st or 2nd. Uh, we're hoping to have a bill out that Friday or the next Tuesday because of Labor Day. So all of our work either way would be completed by Friday or before. So it's a very, very quick turnaround time. And for everyone listening here, uh, appropriations, are, are, we're doing a joint public hearing with Senate appropriations next Thursday and Friday. And anyone is welcome to join in and hear what the public has to say about the budget, uh, their concerns um, or, or their support of certain areas. That will be Thursday at five o'clock or Friday at one o'clock. I think I have those times right, don't I, Teresa? Yes, five and one. And so I am going to stop talking Welcome everyone, and I'm going to turn this over to um, Commissioner Sherling. I'm looking around my Hollywood squares trying to find where you went. Uh, there you are, and uh, welcome, and we look forward to uh, hearing uh, the differences between what was proposed and what you're proposing now. Welcome. Thank you, and uh, it's, it's good, to be, good to be with you. Sorry that uh, we have to be with you in the summer. Um, <laughs> I said the, January. Uh, <laughs> I uh, wishful thinking that what that it, we were doing this in January, but not wishful thinking that we get to January quite that fast. Um, well, I guess it's a double edged sword, right? The quicker we get to January, the faster we get COVID behind us. But anyway, I'll stop talking and just uh, I, I can't see all the Hollywood squares, but I think we've got with us uh, Rick Hollenbeck, our uh, director of administration, finance director, um, Megan Kleinfelter, who's the the deputy there, Chris Herrick, you mentioned, I think Erica Borneman's with us uh, from emergency management and uh, Colonel Birmingham and I, uh, Director DeRocher may be on uh, or may not be on, I'm not sure. In any event, uh, I was just gonna take a moment and walk you through uh, some of the highlights um, at Fortuitous that government operations is on because some of the highlights relate to operational matters. Um, and then turn it over to Rick uh, to go through as many of the ups and downs as the committee would like. Um, as you've heard from other uh, agencies and departments, um, we're, we've crafted a, a budget for 21 uh, that tries to both uh, meet the, the target um, anticipated revenue, but also provides a good foundation for uh, additional challenges we may face in 22. Um, just remind the committee that what we presented in January and February was 
a three-year effort at stabilizing the Department of Public Safety's budget. So a, a variety of alterations to try to get us to a point of stability. And the, the core of that still exists here, but um, you know, because of the, the various things that are happening all at the same time, um, it looks a little bit different. It may take us uh, a little longer to get to that, uh, that budget stability. But that said, um, I think we've got a pretty good budget under the circumstances that's, that's presented here. Um, I'll just highlight a few things that intersect both operations and some of the larger uh, budget items really quickly. Um, we are reimagining a variety of the, the ways in which we do business in part because of the budget, but in part because of what we've learned from remote working and alternate work arrangements as a result of the pandemic. Uh, so we're doing a lot around our space and uh, how we deploy assets and what technology is, is used. And that's reflected in part here uh, in the budget. We've accelerated um, the adoption of some information technology projects. Um, th that was not a result of COVID or the budget. Those are just things that we, we told you we were going to do in January and those are still in motion now. The two primary ones are body cameras for the state police. Uh, that hardware has been delivered. The installation uh, is beginning and we anticipate installation to occur uh, if all goes as planned without any COVID curveballs by the end of the year, um, all the barracks and all the, the patrol uh, division, the field force division um, will be equipped. The other is the, the foundational piece of technology that I've talked about, the computer aided dispatch and records management system. Um, we're within um, just a, a few days of selection at this point. It's taken a little longer than we anticipated because of the hiatus in the process that was caused by COVID. Um, but we're pretty close now to selecting a vendor and that will provide the basis for uh, really everything we do going forward uh, in, in public safety, small p, small s, statewide to inform data-driven approaches, uh, to be able to track things um, like race data in traffic stops and beyond, uh, to be able to track outcomes, to see what works, what doesn't, um, to be able to track use of force, uh, a whole host of, of intersections there. Uh, another major initiative uh, involves the deployment of mental health clinicians. Um, one of the items that you passed in um, at the end of the first portion of the session was a uh, direction to give a report on uh, a plan to deploy mental health clinicians to all the barracks. That was also a, a strategy that was embedded in our modernization plan uh, that we presented in January. Uh, what I submitted in June in response to that showed a three-year phase-in of the next six positions for mental health, two for 21, two for 22, and two for 23. The budget that you're looking at now actually accelerates that process and would deploy seven additional mental health clinicians in, in the coming fiscal year, uh, in, actually in the existing fiscal year. I'm, getting confused about where we're at. We would normally be presenting for the following year, but we're still presenting for this year. So this year we would deploy uh, an additional seven on top of the two that we have. And those would be done as contracts or MOUs or something of that nature with our designated agencies or other service providers. They would not be uh, employees of the Department of Public Safety. Um, so I'm clear, and, Commissioner, a, a total of nine in this budget. There would be a total, a total of as it turns out, uh, we have uh, mm -hmm. memorandums of understanding with the designated agencies, and we're not making contributions to the first two. So mm -hmm. in the budget, there'll be seven. That will bring us to nine, but you've uh, rightfully hit on uh, an interesting challenge going forward, which is how do we balance uh, the delivery methodology and the investment in a way that makes sense? We certainly don't want uh, certain counties or designated agencies to have to uh, put in a, a disproportionate amount of resources. So we're going to work on that, but we've got enough um, budgeted here for seven FTEs, exactly how we end up balancing that out uh, to deliver, whether it's seven or eight or, or nine in the coming year um, will depend on a, a variety of different factors, but a, a significant expansion of that program um, is budgeted here. Thank you. And I just wanted to remind, um, or, or just wanted to say, I see you have 86 pages in this presentation and we have about an hour and a little over an hour. 
we, we really want to stick to the meat of, of, of what you have to share with us with the budget, with policy changes, with issues that are at hand. And we don't need the structure and the number of employees and all of those extra pieces. Um, Absolutely understood. We're not planning to do any of that since we did that with you in January. We're prob you. primarily going to stick to pages three and four, just the, uh, the, the amended ups and downs. Um, and I'm highlighting the big portions of that right now. Okay, and I have a quick question from a Representative Townsend who does have this budget for House Appropriations. Made uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, so just really quickly to make sure I understand the number with regard to the mental health clinicians. In the document uh, which was provided to us today, it says six FTE and I wanted to make sure, is that, does that seven then include one that was in the budget presentation in January plus the six here equals? That's, exa that's exactly right. Um, it's, uh, we had one budgeted uh, in the prior rendition of this. This adds uh, six additional. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And then the final uh, sort of Mr. macro Perhaps. issue. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Commissioner. There's a question from Representative Hooper and then we'll continue. I, I promise we will we will let you get through a sentence before we stop you again. I, I'm just confused about the mental health clinicians and how this is being provided. So what are the two communities that already have these positions that are not being funded? And how are you gonna kind of get equity into the system? The two barracks that have uh, these uh, workers, and we actually have to call them something else as of a meeting uh, that we had yesterday on this topic, uh, the operational components. So um, they're mental health specialists or something along those lines. Okay. Um, the, uh, the two barracks that have them are St. Albans and Westminster. And um, what we're working toward now um, is to develop a master, a memorandum of understanding uh, and or contract that we would ask all the designated agencies or other organizations that are willing to sign on to, um, to participate in. So we have, we're basically going to, we're trying to create a, a singular job description and a singular program um, that delivers the same service and replicates that across the 10 barracks and the, and the, the service areas of those barracks. And um, the, ultimately the, the goal is for the state uh, through the Department of Public Safety and eventually in partnership with the Department of Mental Health and Corrections um, to fund all of those positions. How exactly the transition is gonna look for the two that are already in motion we just don't know the answer to yet, but we are cognizant that we don't want to create an unlevel playing field for those those two uh, designated agencies that are providing the service now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Let's continue, Commissioner. Uh, my final piece is uh, you'll note that there is a part-time position called a fair and impartial police and co-director. Um, both the acceleration of the mental health clinicians and the, the use of this part-time uh, position uh, are in response to the need to accelerate our modernization strategies, particularly around equity, uh, fair and impartial policing, and, and delivering modern service to, uh, to communities. So um, this position is a civilian who would be a co-director along with, uh, right now, Captain Scott, um, eventually Captain Scribner, who will be uh, taking that position later this year when Captain Scott retires, if we allow him to do so. And uh, the, the, uh, the scope and depth of the work um, is just continuing to increase. So um, adding another person with subject matter expertise in this arena, we think is it's a critical time uh, to do that. So that's why you'll see that $65,000 investment uh, in the budget this year. That's the macro overview of the, um, the, the key operational things that are, are impacting the budget in one way uh, or another. And um, I would defer to any of the directors for anything else operational. And then if not, um, 
we can either uh, have the committee guide uh, what you'd like to talk about in the ups and downs, or we can have Rick go through it with you, whichever you Thank prefer. Thank you. We have a question from Representative Townsend, and then I would like to go to the ups and downs sheet. And will that reflect um, all of the ups and downs for the 21 budget or just the change since, um, since January? I don't want to get this wrong. Rick, is, this is, uh, w w which one does this represent? This represents the changes from the original FY21 governor recommend budget. And then um, after Maida's question though, Rick, would you um, uh, help us to remember as best you can uh, pieces from the, from the January proposal that we need to keep in mind? I, sure. I, don't, I don't wanna miss a, a large initiative and, and we'll go back and we'll sort this out. But if there's pieces that we can do here with both committees present, that would be helpful. Uh, Maida, your, uh, your question, please. Yes, please, thanks. Um, in my mind, a, a big operational piece back in January over time was an issue. Um, and I, I, perhaps I missed it, but in my quick overview of the materials provided for today, I didn't see overtime. Has that gone away as an issue or not? It has not, that's a great question. So if, if you were to look at the January ups and downs, you'd see um, significant investments in, um, in overtime, uh, a rebalancing of uh, shift, uh, of, excuse me, of uh, vacancy savings. Mm -hmm. And um, we spent a, a bunch of time sort of walking through how all of those things relate to one another and how that balances out for the personnel costs. Um, those challenges remain, but what we've done in the presentation here is uh, all, it builds on all of those changes. So um, with the governor's recommend as the basis for the work that's, that's being presented today, um, we get to the first year, we get through the first year of relative stability in the, in the three-year exercise uh, on the public safety budget. So um, I hope that makes sense. So, so it, 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 you check as to whether or not my brain has taken this in. In, in January, for overtime, it showed $1.3 million. So somehow that's been able to be absorbed, sorted out somehow, so that that's not something for us to worry about. That is that's still in it. the proposal. It's it, in this budget. It it's... It's just, we're showing you the, the ups and downs from that prior budget. So oh, how so has that, the prior that, budget changed? So but this uh, is where Meta, to, to this is Meta where it becomes confusing because yeah. we're working with the proposal as well as the changes. And since you don't see the changes on here, they're, they're still in, in the numbers that we received in January. Sorry. Thank you, I got it. So 1.3 million in overtime is still a reality. It is, and okay, if you recall, it. that's a, that's one piece of a multi-year strategy to stabilize that. Um, okay. the, yeah, uh, I don't want to confuse things further, so I, I won't add any more detail because I, I fear it won't be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'm going to uh, move to a question from uh, Representative Lanfer, and then we're going to move right to the chart, please. Diane? So I'm so grateful that I actually brought home my book and the only thing I ever print is, is the actual crosswalks or ups and downs from. So I've got a note in here, um, Commissioner, on that line, that 1.3 that, that made us so, so eloquently put um, that next to that overtime of 1.3 million, I made note, if this is enough. So, you know, time has now passed and obviously you haven't made any change to it on this new, but maybe you could Heil, as to whether or not that was sufficient, do, do you have extra or are you expecting to spend even more? We don't anticipate a surplus or a deficit there. Um, we've made some operational adjustments that relate both to COVID and um, the budget realities of, of 21. Um, and we're trying to uh, keep a handle on overtime to the greatest extent possible. Um, but 1.3 was a, a, 
the first portion of what we anticipated would be a multi-year uh, need for an increase in overtime to get to uh, a stabilized budget. Um, we have some, some new experience now as a result of the last four months. So what, that, what those out years look like, um, I'm not sure I'd want to put a firm number on it, but Rick could tell us what, the, what we thought the Delta was in January, if he has it available. Sorry to put him on the spot. The, the delta in what we expect to be over or short, or if it, in the second year of budget stabilization we were going to ask for additional overtime, yep. is that right? I believe a sm a small number, a much smaller number. Right. I, I I wish I could remember the number, but it's been so many numbers from that, since then that I I don't have it off the off the top. But so. Let's say as a placeholder, it was another $500,000 to get to what we think the realistic annual average spend is on overtime. Um, we've got some new experience now. Um, and uh, Colonel Birmingham and his team have done uh, a variety of really creative things in the last couple of months. So that number may go down. I don't anticipate it's going to go up. Yeah. Well, 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 thank you. I would, you know, and I, the experience that you have now to compare it to is a rather odd year to be comparing, I would imagine. So it, it might be tough to even get a handle on if that was enough or, or too much, but thank you. Commissioner, you, you had the number right. It was just under 600K. I wish I could say I pulled it out of a brain cell, but it was a guess. Always take credit. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Rick. Let's uh, start going down through the appropriations and um, so that we fully understand uh, some of the reductions if they're part, you had a 3% target. Did you also have a 3% target in, within your department from the administration? Uh, yes, roughly a 3% target. Do, yeah. Is it possible for Teresa to share the document to everybody or does everybody have it in front of them? It's in front of us. Okay, great. Okay, and so. if you could, if you could uh, tell which reductions are three percent, and you know how you're going to make those work and not impact the work that you do, and which uh, perhaps COVID money was uh, used, at, you know, to to help uh, with some of these initiatives, and um, and let's let's leave it at those two. Okay, I think you'll you'll see that the the reduction of roughly three percent falls to the bottom line. Individually, we have a variety of reductions that are not necessarily tied to a particular percentage with the exception of the internal service fees, which mm -hmm. are in general 5% reductions. Right. But I, I can run through this and explain all of that. If, we, if you would like to start with state police, uh, for example, the fee for space and workers comp, those are 5% uh, general fund reductions of our internal really? service fees. We've heard from BGS and we will hear on fee for space, ADS and workers comp. So we understand those five percent, those reductions. Okay. Great. Um, the next line, the mental health clinicians, the commissioner had spoke to that already, uh, as well as the fair and impartial uh, policing co-director. Are there any questions on that? Um, I don't have questions. I'm not seeing any. Commissioner, uh, Representative Lamfer, is your hand up from before? Yes, ma'am. Sorry, I'll take it down. And okay. I have a question from uh, Representative Hooper, as in Robert Hooper, not Mary. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, are these mental health positions contract? They are listed as FTEs, but are they contract positions? And how are we guaranteeing any kind of coverage if that's appropriate for this kind of question period? They are contracted positions. Um, they're full-time employees, but not employees of the state. So we can modify that to, for some clarity there. So how are we dealing with coverage then? You have one eight hour person and a 18 hour shift. Um, this is, uh, we're trying to get just to a base of one um, specialist per barracks at this stage. Um, and we actually discussed this yesterday, what the, um, what the schedule would look like. And the, the reality is it would be based on the need. So um, 
what are the times when the uh, clients are most in need, uh, we would mirror the schedule to, uh, to that based on call volume assessment. Thank you. Thank you, let's continue. Okay, next line item is the body camera hardware that we had in our original FY21 GovRec. We were able to make that purchase out of FY20 funds. So we're backing that out here. Okay, so if we don't have a reduction in any actual body cameras. You were able to purchase them with 2020 money, and therefore, you are you have all the body cameras that you need, and you don't need an appropriation. You can back out this amount. For sort of correct. The body cam project is in process, but we have uh, we have uh, obligated those funds in a purchase order, so we won't need the FY21 funding. Thank you. I should uh, flag for you, and uh, at least some members of government operations are aware of this, that uh, as passed S219, we believe needs a slight language tweak. Uh, what it, the, the way it's written, uh, it would require a body camera for all 334 troopers, including folks like the colonel and the majors and special investigation units and things like that. Um, so unless amended, um, it, it would double the cost uh, of the body camera project. Um, so we're hoping to work with the legislature to make some uh, amendments to, to ensure that we've got body cameras with the right personnel, but that we're not uh, needlessly spending money on folks that uh, any video they take would be uh, quite boring. Uh, and for some actually would potentially be inappropriate. So just wanted to flag that for you. Thank you. Um, let's finish this section and then we'll open up the first section to more questions. Okay. Next line item, vacancy savings. This is uh, largely for us to al allow uh, for the mental health clinicians and the fair and impartial policing director. And travel line item being cut for obvious reasons with COVID, nobody's really uh, traveling out of state unless it's you know something mission critical. And I'll stop there. You wanted to yeah, I have questions. a question from Representative Lamper. Sorry to be back. So I, I just want to make sure that I'm reading this right. And this question might be for, for Rick on there. So underneath the, the body cameras, in what you're presenting today, you have a reduction of 161623 And in January, you had, as a line item, 387747 for, I'm thinking, is the same thing. But now you can give. Now you can reduce that by 161. So, is would it be true then to say that you use 226,000? The difference uh, no, between the, those. The remainder is for other parts of the project. Uh, the 161,623 was specifically for body camera hardware, and that was to be combined with the one-time funds, which we actually spent down. And how, what was, how much was the one-time funds different uh, from the 387? I, I don't have one that number available, but th there was the one-time funds that were appropriated for the camera project as a whole. Yes. Budgets yeah. ago. Yes, and so there was some left in that. I can't remember the exact amount, but I can get that to you. Okay, well, I, it's actually just for me to be able to figure out when I'm reading your the old one to the new one, if I'm, if I'm if by okaying it that 387 is now different than what it, it yes. was before, it, right? It would be the the 226 you mentioned would that remains, new, and I believe okay. that is for the uh, for the the um, storage fees. Yeah, that's sto yeah. I've got note storage in the clouds. Okay, thank you. I am getting it. Some I'm catching on. Slowly. Thank you, Diane. Representative Townsend. I was just going to suggest that that was for the storage. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and could we talk a bit about the vacancy savings of seven hundred sixty-five thousand? Were those are those actual vacant positions, or uh, are you doing a reduction in staff? There's, There's no. no it, sorry, go ahead. There's no reduction in staff for those numbers. This is 
this is going to put us in line with what we're projecting for vacancy savings. And I'm sure the commissioner was about to speak to recruitment. So I'll let him speak to that. Yeah, recruitment has uh, has slowed a bit, as you might imagine. It was already slow. It's slowing a little more. Uh, the academy's capacity is limited by COVID operating uh, guidelines. So we were only able to put uh, 11, I believe, into this academy class where we normally shoot for 15. Um, and then, of course, we anticipate uh, we can project retirements and, and things and, and basic attrition. So we can come up with a number that is as close to realistic as possible based on the overall operating conditions. Thank you. Uh, Representative Hooper. Excuse me. Thank you. I'm trying to understand, put together how going forward, you will pay for the mental health clinicians. So I, I understand that you're using vacancy savings this year, but this strikes me as a commitment into the future to maintain that level of savings and transfer the funding to these positions, to these contracts. Am I correct in understanding that? You are correct, Representative. This is not your first budget review. <laughs> um, the, uh, we have a number of potential strategies. Um, some may involve vacancy savings if recruitment continues to be a challenge. Uh, we're also talking about whether for some kinds of responses, it makes sense to use these uh, responders in lieu done. of uh, police officers. So uh, once we have them deployed, we'll get a better sense of how much of the call volume they can actually take away from um, the field force. Uh, I don't wanna put too much stock in there because we don't have a lot of field force. We, we we're not that big. Um, so there's not a lot of extra room there, but that is something that we're looking at. Uh, and then the, the third piece is um, we really see this in the future uh, as a partnership because it won't just be reductions in calls for service to uh, the state police and law enforcement agencies. If we do this successfully, it'll, it'll reduce visits to the emergency department, it'll reduce incarceration, it'll reduce some of the workload for the Department of Mental Health, it'll prevent things from getting to a stage where, where uh, it's very expensive. So if you use the analogy of a typical healthcare uh, scenario. If you wait for an infection to fester too long, you end up with surgery and debreeding and very expensive uh, healthcare. If you can, um, if you can deal with it early uh, and often, as these uh, these folks are, this program is designed to to deliver that kind of service. Um, then the the overall goal is to reduce cost at the back end, and then hopefully we have multiple people coming to the table to help fund this in the long term. What has stymied the growth of this program to date is starting from a point where we're trying to build the coalition and build the multi-faceted funding just to get it off the ground. What we're suggesting is we're gonna do it in reverse. We're gonna get all these folks on the ground. We're gonna show the efficacy of the program. And then we're gonna to go to people and say, listen, put up 10 grand here, 20 grand there, 30 grand there. You're saving way more than that. Yeah, and, and I'm sure that you will be able to show that. I, I'm very excited by this and I wanna congratulate you on, the, um, on this initiative. Uh, it, it's fabulous. Um, I hope that you will try to gather that data with both the communities, the healthcare system, the DAs, et cetera, so that we can see that and continue to support it over the years. Thanks. That's a great, great point. Uh, our data system is one piece of the puzzle, but we've already engaged the state's mm -hmm. chief data officer, Kristen McClure, to, to start to think about how do we cross pollinate data from multiple state organizations where it's typically very siloed uh, so that we can paint a picture of what's effective and we can paint a picture of what's not effective in terms of our policy decisions. Yeah. And then add to that needing to pull up from the community level too, all of those effects that aren't at the state level. It's complex. That's, absolutely. Thank you, Mary. I'm sitting here laughing at myself because I realized I asked a ridiculous question about vacancy savings. Of course, they're vacant, um, they're vacant positions. <laughs> uh, 
I'm a little distracted today. Um, I sent a daughter off to school and it's a little nerve wracking. But my question, what I meant to ask, were, are there critical positions that you won't be filling in order to achieve these savings that you have been trying to fill? No, uh, we're not leaving anything, um, anything critical on the table. And we have two other questions. Um, I have one from Representative Jessup and then Representative Thompson. Great, uh, thank you. So this may be well-trod ground in terms of the policy committee, but I thought I heard that the rollout of the body cams would be at the end of the year. And my question is, is that at the end of the calendar year or fiscal year? And does the delay have to do with some of the earlier back and forth with storage or with something else that you could lightly touch upon in a fiscal committee? It, if, if everything goes as currently planned, uh, the deployment will be complete by the end of the calendar year. Um, is it possible it could go beyond that? Yes, the, the, the technicians that are coming uh, to help us with the installation are coming from Texas. So there's some very stringent guidelines on what they can do and how they can travel. Um, the, there's no real delay. It's just uh, we've got to equip 202 uniform troopers and 10 barracks with gear. So it's just a, a very, uh, it's a very large technology project. Okay, thanks. It's just interesting to see that something purchased in fiscal year 20, often in our budgets when something is purchased, it is whipped out the door and to see it show up again. But these are unusual times and I take your points. Thank you. That was, uh, you. just to be clear, uh, it, it took until this year to get the final funding um, so that we've got all the, all the dollars necessary. And it, it also took the, the cost of the uh, equipment and the storage to come down to sort of meet in the middle. So uh, a lot of things had to happen to get this needle threaded. Thank you. And Representative Townsend. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, going to, to personnel in a different way. Back in January, I had a note here that we had 26 trooper vacancies for which we were recruiting. Are, are we still down 26 or thereabouts? I'm hoping the Colonel has that number off the top of his head. I, I haven't looked at that in a few months because um, I've been distracted. Uh, I know we just I, hired a few. We, we, it, yeah, we are. I don't have the, the exact number, uh, but I can get it for you with the 11 in the see it's it's hard because uh, there are 11 in the class right now, but they are not deployed to the field. So they are they are technically not being utilized, even though they are taking up positions. Uh, but I can get you the accurate uh, vacancy count um, and transmit it over there for you. Thank you very much. Yeah, if you recall, we, we the department used to render uh, vacancies included uh, troopers who were in training at the academy, and we're going to pivot to a different representation of that where they're not really truly vacancies. Those people have been hired, but they're not available. So you'll see three numbers. You'll see authorized staff, uh, number available, and then the number that are unavailable either. Be, and there are other things that cause that too. Uh, it could be a, an extended injury or, or uh, commonly some kind of military deployment or something like that that causes unavailable staff. Thank you. And I think we should move to the second appropriation, the criminal justice services. Sure. Uh, the first two lines are I, uh, internal service fees that we covered mm -hmm. that you are aware of those. And uh, so I'll bring us down to the third line, which is travel. Um, as I mentioned before, we're, we're cutting travel for obvious reasons that people just simply uh, aren't traveling under the COVID restrictions. Uh, registration is for uh, the same reason that is uh, a line item that we typically use for a training or a conference. And so we don't have a, a lot of that going on. And then a small amount in vacancy savings. And as far as the travel, these would these may be one-time savings depending on uh, the need and you know traveling to conferences or, or whatever. Um, you're counting them as a, a one-time savings and, and hope to reinstate these amounts for travel and registration? 
Well, I, I guess it, it all depends on whether or not technology will lend That's itself true. to those trainings in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, I would uh, want to kick that one to the commissioner. Um, uh, it's a future that's unknown at this point, whether I understand, yeah. I understand your answer. Are there any other questions on this, on this, um, this budget? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Diane, I didn't, sorry, I didn't get my hand up quick enough. So I'm looking in the, in the January, the only thing on there that I have a question on, I'm sorry if I, if you can't hear me, I have to look at my book, was, uh, <clears throat> there was a swap of $1.1 million of general fund for using special funds, uh, fees from background checks. And I've just got a note here that said there was a narrow window to use this and if and you were able to save general fund dollars. Uh, do you recall what that was about and did that happen? Yes, yeah, so it's in, go ahead, Rick. It's the criminal history record check fund and we uh, switched a lot of the uh, budgets in the Vermont Crime Information Center from general funds to those special funds in order to help us accelerate the budget stabilization plan. And so that is still in play here because we haven't un undone it here in this crosswalk. Okay. Um, I'm not sure about the limited time frame that I, I, I'm not sure what that refers to. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Diane. Excellent note. It may Thank you for this it detail. may refer to the fact that we uh, it, that's the uh, the bulk of that's for the CAD RMS project and that it you know, that's a it, it's coming to a it's critical phase right now of vendor selection negotiation and execution. Um, I think uh, do I have some other no I don't have any other questions on um, the second appropriation. Let's move to emergency management, please. Okay, emergency management. I'll skip over the workers' comp and go right to the uh, the federal funds that we're uh, uh, we're making available from a grant uh, due to COVID, and allowing us to restore the general funds that we were uh, going to use in the original FY21 GovRec. Okay. Had that gone through, we would not have been able to reverse this because it would have been supplanting at that point. But since we Bill never passed. We're able to restate this as federal funds. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then the, the swift water rescue and damage assessment assessments somewhat go together uh, in that if there's a disaster, um, we need a, a flood, sorry, a flood event. Uh, we need our swift water teams staged and uh, active if there is anyone in jeopardy. And the damage assessments are so that we can use our Sorry, uh, Erica, I don't know if it's LEPCs or RPCs in, in order to uh, do our damage assessments. And these, these damage assessments are absolutely critical to uh, a declaration should we be reaching the threshold. Thank you. I don't know if these explanatory. Um, Erica, did you want to weigh in? I hear a background noise. Erica, was that you or not? No, thank you. I was I was muted. I think it was some echoing, but um, uh, Rick was uh, able to capture that um, succinctly and um, available if there's any questions. Thank you. I think those are pretty self-explanatory. And so I would suggest we move to the fire safety division, please. Okay, for fire safety, uh, I'll skip again over the workers comp. Uh, temporary employee line item reduction of 20,000. That is um, a scaling back of the uh, temporary position that was funded in FY20 in order to do curriculum development. Uh, and that's all for general funds in that, but if you direct your attention a few columns over to the special fund cuts, I'm sure you wanna know why we're, we're restating that. Um, the fire safety uh, special fund uh, experienced a deficit this year. Uh, it's ended the year at about $900,000 in the hole. Um, so we have begun making uh, some reductions to try to get a balanced 21. Um, 21 will bring a significant amount of cigarette revenue uh, that we didn't see in 20. 
So by cutting this, these line items of just under 400,000, that should uh, bring a balance to the 21. Um, we still have the FY20 uh, deficit to deal with, however. And we do have some questions here. Um, uh, Representative Hooper, Mary? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm not surprised that there's, I assumed there would be a down in your revenues just because of the construction season being disrupted. Is there something more than just a COVID related response as an issue with the fund? Or is it really simply the disruption of the construction? I think it's that, mostly, oh, sorry, Michelle. That, that appears to be most of it. There's also, uh, we've seen a, a slight change in the, the types of permits um, that are being issued. We're seeing a, a, quite a few that are in the $199,000 project range that are scooting in under the wire uh, in terms of the fees. Um, so that's a piece of it as well. Okay. And, and given that, it, well, the folks who work in this division are always awfully busy, but were you, did they get redeployed to other work if there was a downturn in the work? And were you able to draw down CRF money for the other work that they may have been doing? They did not get redeployed in terms of their uh, their assignment. They had an occasional um, uh, thing here and there that they helped uh, out with COVID, but uh, there was an opportunity to accelerate the clearance of backlogs of, of permits and get things uh, taken care of during that, that time when uh, the number of new applications went down. Okay, that's, well, that's always wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Commissioner, you mentioned the fee and that, you know, being able to, I don't, I, I don't want to use the word circumvent, but being able to scoot in under, under certain limits, does the, does the fee schedule need to be uh, re-examined, in your opinion? Uh, do we have Director DeRocher on? I, I know he's taking a look sure. at that. Yes, this is Mike DeRocher. Um, that's a good question. Um, we really don't want to change that figure right now, what we did is we tried to prevent a bottleneck of permits by offering constituents a uh, kind of a, a quicker way of receiving permits for these small projects that were uh, under 200,000. And when we looked across all our permits, about 3,000 a year, there was 30 to 40% of our permits were under 200,000. And it wasn't just a bottleneck in the volume of them, but it was that a lot of the information that was submitted to us was incomplete and caused a lot of domino effects, uh, a lot of extra communication. So we redid the permit application and we now send a field person out to the field to expedite the permit. So there was just a lot of advantages to it. Uh, like the commissioner said, um, you know, when people are doing two hundred and seventy-five or three hundred thousand dollars, they're going to submit something claiming it's two hundred thousand dollars. And you know, we just aren't in a position right now to be asking for receipts and stuff. Uh, we do require an end of cost valuation form. We do receive some extra funding in some circumstances, but the project right now is pretty successful. But we are like the commissioner said indirectly, there's a, there's a little loss there. I'm not sure if you uh, were uh, on a fees, uh, you know, on a fee schedule to review fees, but, you know, fees are, are really to cover the cost of services. And if we're running a, if we're not meeting the bottom line here, and, and I, I don't know if there's a deficit in the fund or if you're able to use other funds uh, to, address, to address where we're not coming to zero, are we running a deficit in this fund is one question. And number two is the fees have not been, I don't think updated in five years and have the cost increased in five years or have they remained the same? Um, just personally, I, I don't recall exactly what year it was, uh, Rick, that we went in and raised our permit fee, our construction permit fee. But the last time we did it, we raised it 45%. And 
I took a, um, I took a lot of heat when that rate was raised by 45%. And um, I guess I'm probably still taking some heat for it, to be honest with you. Um, but what the issue is, like the commissioner said, we've had a, there's been a downtick in the construction uh, fees. And that's where the majority of our special fund revenue is generated is by construction permit fees. When, when the construction was good seven, eight years ago, we were carrying a $2 million surplus. Mm -hmm. So we are solely dependent on special fund revenue. We receive no general fund for, for, you know, for our fire safety program. I understand that. Yeah. Uh, he has to jump 45%. It worries me that we're not doing the increase uh, you know, on, on a smaller basis, depending on the cost. And when we wait till they get out of control, then I can understand why people are upset when a fee jumps so high. So it's, yeah. I, I understand the don't raise any fees, but then if you're not paying for the cost of service and your jump is substantial, that doesn't make any sense as well. Yeah. My second question was, is there a deficit in this, in this uh, are, are we running a deficit here or are we using other funds um, to balance this budget? Because- right reductions to cover the costs that it was 900,000 and um, I don't see the full 900,000. So is there a deficit in the fund? Yes, there is a, if you look at it on a cash basis, the deficit is around 900,000. Okay. And is that just for this year or have we accumulated, is there a larger overall deficit? Uh, it's mostly this year. Uh, we ended with a very small deficit in uh, fiscal 19, um, but it, I mean, it was under 50,000, I believe, you know, but yeah, this year was mostly due to the, the COVID. We may have ended with another small deficit this year if, if there if it had not been for COVID. Thank you. It's, I think we'll want to watch. Um, let's go to appropriate, I don't see any other questions on um, this section, so let's move to the fifth appropriation. So this is a administration division, and the first line has to do with the uh, e-ticket um, contracts. Um, this is a project that was uh, completed with uh, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration funding, and we have been seeing the end of that funding uh, in the past couple of years. Um, so we thought we were gonna need general funds for it this year. Um, we were, um, during the midst of the, the COVID crisis, one of the things that happened is we found that um, there were some uh, NHTSA funds available to do one more year of these contracts. So we are uh, backing out those general funds and putting it back into the interdepartmental fund uh, because that federal money is handled by uh, the Agency of Transportation. The uh, temporary employee line item, um, we are, we're cutting the general fund temporary employee line item because we haven't had much luck in hiring a temporary position anyway. So, and we're trying to cut costs where we can. So that's a place where it was a pretty easy cut. Um, travel for the same reasons I've mentioned above. And for the rest of what's in administration, it, they're all internal service fees, uh, workers' comp fee for space, ADS, human resources, and vision, and the insurances. Okay, are there questions on the administrations, on the reductions here um, from anyone? And, and anyone from government operations, please, if you have questions. Please raise your hands, your virtual hand. Okay, I'm not seeing any. And uh, then let's move to the forensic laboratory, please. Absolutely. In the forensic laboratory, um, the only one that's not an internal service fee is our contractual line item. Uh, we did add a position to the lab in the original GovRec and that allowed us to reduce some of our general fund contracts and 
uh, also some of it was due to the availability of federal funds to, to cover uh, some of the contracts. Are there questions yes. this section? Pete, uh, Representative Fagan. Thank you. Uh, Rick, thank you. Good seeing you again. Hey, uh, Rick, when the Department of Health was in, we, uh, they mentioned that the, the lab, and I can never, I know we have at least two labs, but the lab was um, doing a lot of uh, COVID-related testing. And the other testing that they would normally do was then uh, was then sent out to other labs for those other labs to conduct the test. In other words, there was no reduction in services, just where the actual performance of the test occurred was different. So is, number one, is that this lab uh, that, that we're talking about? Because I know it's certainly not the agricultural lab. Um, and where would the expenses for paying those other labs to do these tests show up? This is uh, representative. This is the Vermont Forensic Lab. Uh, you're talking about the public health lab. Um, okay, so there's so three there, labs. Yeah, it, it's there may be more than three. I think A and R may have a lab as well. Sometimes it's hard to keep track. Thank you very much. It, it is. Do, but but on on that that note, is your lab uh, able to keep up with the uh, with the demands that have been placed upon it, um, or are you also um, um, seeking outside assistance? No, our lab is uh, is in reasonably good shape. We actually have okay. just assigned uh, two microbiologists to assist with the health lab to uh, bolster their capabilities for COVID testing. There's part of it. Thank you very much. Are, is there an interdepartmental transfer to cover for that? There will be. Not at this. Yeah, there, there yeah, will. They're just, okay. they're just starting their training. Gotcha. Very good. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Representative Towns. So following directly on what uh, Representative Fagan was asking about, I was looking over my notes from January and we had a backlog at that point at the lab with regard to controlled substance cases and latent print examinations and things of that nature. Everything's, it sounds like everything's more than up to, up to speed at this point. We've, we've got enough personnel and enough m m materials and all of that. The, uh, there's always a, a bit of a backlog in both fingerprinting and uh, in drug analysis, um, just because the case uh, the cases continue to, to climb. Um, but it's not so substantial that uh, Director Conti is indicating that uh, she's resource deprived. Excellent, thanks. Thank you, uh, Representative Jessup. Hi, uh, just a quick question about the forensic lab and capital investments. And I apologize, I don't know a lot about this budget. It falls to Rep Townsend. But um, if retail cannabis were to go online, are all the pieces of equipment and staff in place for that? Or would that be an upward pressure potentially? Thanks. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. I'll have to ask uh, Director Conti, and I guess it depends on what the, in part, on what the uh, demands on testing would look like. I don't believe the forensic lab is doing um, any cannabis testing at this point. And I, I would, if the legislature is looking for uh, a place uh, to have that kind, to have that kind of testing done, I don't believe the forensic lab would be the appropriate spot. I think that would be the agriculture lab. Yeah, I guess I'm not. That's accurate. That, that is exactly what the legislature has um, considered. So just to be sure that I'm following any testing that may potentially be needed, be it blood work I understood went out of state. It used to go to Pennsylvania. I don't know if it still does. But let's just say in the hypothetical, again, I'm just looking forward for upward pressures. If there were to be, in fact, be some sort of a saliva-based test, that would not happen at the forensic lab. Is that what I heard? That m might. Uh, that depends on the nature of the test and um, what the chemistry, what tools are required, uh, et cetera. I'm sorry, I was interpreting that as uh, more of the commercial market. Uh, any, 
any testing required to support the commercial market, not the criminal side of, uh, of things. Okay, thank you. I, okay, I just wanted to be sure you were done. Uh, Representative Helm, you have a question? <clears throat> Representative Helm. I don't see you, Bob. <clears throat> um, I will come back to you, Bob. I have a question for the commissioner until uh, Bob is able to uh, come back on. I wanted to go back to the part-time position for the, <clears throat> for the position for fair and impartial, impartial policing. And in light of what is going on nationwide, I, I need some comfort that a part-time position um, is enough to, to do the training that is needed and to make sure that Vermont does not come into the spotlight like in many other uh, cities and states across the nation and what is happening uh, for training um, at where, where um, the training in, tell me where the training center is. Um, I need help the, with- The police academy? The police, uh, the training at the police academy, yes. Can you tell me about the training that happens there and then what this po position will do? And if you feel this is sufficient to address any issues? Uh, a part-time position is not sufficient to address issues. Uh, we have put forth a, a 10 point strategy um, in addition to the modernization plan that we presented to you in January um, that we do believe is a comprehensive suite of, of areas for um, improvement for modernization, for new technology, for new pr uh, process and practice uh, statewide, not just within the Department of Public Safety, but the, the 10 areas mm -hmm. that we've identified are, are all things we think should be standardized on a statewide basis for all law enforcement agencies. So it's really working on all of those things um, that is essential. And this position acts in a, a role to help us coordinate all of that. So it's a piece of a very, much larger puzzle, but an essential piece. Commissioner, if I may add to that. Sure. I don't know, can you hear me? Uh, Matt Birmingham, uh, Director of the State Police. Uh, what's important to remember too, is that we have devoted uh, full-time sworn members of the state police uh, that are, um, one is a captain, Captain Gary Scott, his full-time position in the state police is the director of fair and partial policing and community affairs. And he works very closely with our office of professional development, which has um, another staff of um, five uh, sworn members that are dealing in, in service training, hiring and recruiting. And all of the fair and impartial policing objectives and goals for the department are pushed out across all command staff and all members of the department. So um, it's not just not the all of the all of our fair and impartial policing goals and objectives are not falling on this part time position. It's supplementing an already very robust fair and impartial policing uh, unit of the state police. Thank you for that information. Um, I don't see Representative Hill had a hand up. Bob, did you have a question? Your hand is up. You need to unmute. There we go. There you go. She had me lathered with all sorts of things I had to erase first. <laughs> so can I can I go to any topic I want? Well, within reason. Yeah. Well, has to be on topic. <laughs> I can do that. I, I can handle public safety and some things commerce, and that's about it. <laughs> I'm going to ask you public safety. There is a, I think it's a proposal within the department right now to charge local municipalities for PSAP work. And I think, from what I can gather, is to charge the municipalities that have departments and for me for one I have two departments in my district and one of them they the way they figured it's going to be half of their annual budget is what it'll cost them so I, I guess I'm just trying to find out what's going on we've been through this before 
and it's always kind of skittered off to the side and never happened. Um, then my understanding also is there are many other things in that bill that I don't even know what they are. And um, anyways, I'd like to see if somebody could call me, <laughs> send me a copy of the bill, um, maybe uh, just a snapshot of what's in the bill and some information so as I know when I'm talking about this, I know what I, I have a little bit of accuracy in what I'm saying. Sure, can we, can, uh, we can send you the updated, uh, the updated bill um, and uh, somewhere on uh, various committee sites, there are copies of our presentation and a, a written document that outlines our modernization strategy from January. We can get you those. Um, DC Herrick just sent me a text message uh, offering to help uh, facilitate that. Um, so it sounds like he can get you all of that uh, pretty quickly. But for the entire committee, just uh, partially to remind you of some of the things we talked about in January, but to tell you where we're at with this right now, well, what we put forth in the modernization strategy in part was a rebalancing of the way that the state supports public safety statewide. Um, we're suggesting that there are things that we are currently charging municipalities for or not providing for service that we should be providing. Two big examples, the computer aided dispatch and records management system. We believe the state should be delivering that as a core service to public safety organizations statewide without a charge. So um, what your departments are seeing representative is a piece of the puzzle, but they're also, if they're police departments, they're, they're seeing a reduction and ultimately an elimination of charges that are coming for technology. Um, the other piece is the uh, mental health clinicians that uh, we, as we craft this uh, program, the plan is not to just respond and provide service to the, the service area that's covered by the barracks and the state police, but to uh, cover the entire service area that, that barracks uh, would cover to include all uh, municipalities. So to provide additional assistance there. Um, uh, on the other side of that coin, um, there has been a can uh, that has been kicked down the road, so to speak, for some time around um, creating parity with the way that dispatch services are paid for statewide. And this is a much longer conversation, but the the oversimplified version is that there are some municipalities who are paying uh, a lot for dispatch services. There's some that are paying a little for dispatch services. And then there are some that are getting service from the state and they're getting it for free. And it just doesn't create parity across uh, the, the taxpayers. So we've put forward a plan to uh, create some parity, to not overcharge people, to only charge for the calls that they're going to and only charge for dispatchers, not charge them for any kind of overhead or administrative fees or ADS fees or anything like that. Um, what we think is a very pragmatic approach to just uh, creating parity across the public safety organizations for a service that is quite um, complex and, and, uh, and costly. That's the simplified version. Mm -hmm. Well, can I get a little more complicated version? Absolutely. And what, to be clear, we've been talking with public safety organizations since January about this plan. So it should not have come as a surprise. We've had multiple conference calls. We sent multiple uh, communications to them. Um, and the most recent one was just, uh, I believe, yesterday. Well, I'm not going to say it's a surprise. It, I, I don't believe it was to them. It was a little snuck up a little bit on me only because we have not been around the system very close here since last March. So that, and that's my, my fault. Maybe I should figure out a way of keeping better track of things. But as far as my law enforcement, they, they didn't try to tell me that it was a surprise by any stretch of the imagination. Great. So. A, a final note is that what we also asked uh, agencies to do when we sent a, another round of correspondence in the last couple of days was to, you know, to, to sort of unpack their numbers, tell us whether they think we've got the numbers wrong or there's there's a cross section of their calls that they shouldn't be billed for, et cetera. So we're, we're still in a phase where we're trying to come to um, what the, the final numbers should look like and we're asking for their input. Right. All right. Thank you. Thank Bob. you. Thank you. Um, Mary, did you have one final question or not? I can't, I don't see your hands. Yes, I did. 
Yes, well, I can't raise my hand um, since I'm a co-host. Um, my question, I'd like to go back to the fire prevention uh, fund. Did, can you tell me, I, I thought Mike DeRosha mentioned that there was a surplus in that fund. When was that and how much was it? About approximately? Uh, maybe Rick can chime in too, but it was probably maybe five, six, seven years ago. And to be honest, the carry forward balance was about 3.2 million. And okay. the reason, so um, what we tried to do at that point was to uh, hire people, honestly, to help us out because we're just bombarded with work. Um, but we couldn't, we couldn't hire people. And if I recall, that was a time where the state, the state actually took the funding, the carry forward money from us. Um, and so, you know, where we are right now, Mary, I know you're familiar with our division. Um, you know, we're trying to put forth a budget right now that I think it, it more aligns our budget and expenses to what the actual revenues are. And, um, and, and so that's what we're doing. We're being fiscally responsible by um, recognizing that, you know, our revenue may be down this year, so let's try to control our expenses the best we can. And that's what we put forth here was an honest attempt to reduce our expenses uh, without, uh, devastating our services and so forth and and we can do this so um we'll have to see how the economy is it's hard to in this environment right now it's hard to predict where we're gonna where we're gonna be i i appreciate that mike and i yeah. i didn't want us to leave this discussion thinking oh there was a deficit what were you up to yeah. the fact is you guys have been slammed it was a huge amount of work. Um, you, you tried to stay on top of it, but we also made a decision to use some of that fund balance somewhere else. And right. maybe we should, I, I, I don't know how much detail, but we may wanna come back to this. But what, when we say, oh my gosh, there is now a deficit in that fund, let's remember that in fact, monies were taken out of that fund that would have covered that deficit. Correct. I think I'm correct in thinking about it that way. That is correct. And then secondly, um, we have been, our budget, our expenses have been coming in under budget. So, you know, I, I have been under our spending authority. So this is a revenue issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah. And 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 I think this is to the commissioner, to the finance director. Were were the funds in in the fire prevention special fund used elsewhere within the department, or were they swept up as part of the? And I always forget the words that we use that describe how we how we take money. You're, you're talking about when when it was. Uh... Reverted to the general fund? Yes. So it yeah. was reverted to the general fund. That's what we did. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It I'd was not back. used elsewhere in the Department of Public Safety. No, I I can look back. I think we're we're looking at like Mike said around seven years ago. Yeah. And I can get those details on that that um fund scoop. Okay. Thank you. I, Thank you, I have this memory of spending some money on some police cruisers, but I may be making that up. Um, nope, nobody that, here says I was right. Uh, in that budget, yes, we did have an increase um, in state police cruisers in that same budget because we had we had sort of robbed from those line items for several years, and this, the fleet was in badly uh, badly needed to be replaced. Okay. Thank that you. That money used well. It, it was just reverted back to the general fund, and then there was an increase within the um, a, another one of your budget I, uh, line items. Correct. Uh, we have one last final question. We're at our final. Uh, we're at the end of our time allotment. Uh, Representative Harrison. 
Yeah, uh, thanks, Kitty. Um, so we, I'm just not familiar with all your budget documents and we touched upon it, but I'm not sure where it shows. But on the body cam issue, I just wanted to revisit that again. The storage issue has always been an issue with the cost. Is that built into the budget? And is that why there is no difference shown if we're going to put these live uh, in the coming months? So the, the storage is in the budget. The hardware is the only section that was removed. I'm trying to get back to the page that would show you the reduction in equipment. That would be, if you look at page five of 84, you can see it in the department roll up under uh, the equipment line item. 161.623 down. Page five. Yeah. So you can see the that line item being reduced in equipment only. Okay, so the the um, cloud storage or whatever you use for backup, where would that show? I believe that would be in the contract line item or software. I'll have to I'll have to drill down on where that is. Exactly. Okay, I, all I just want to be it's in there. It's in there. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Jim. And uh, any follow-up questions, we will uh, put those through Meta, who has this budget, and Meta. Um, will you make sure to keep in contact with Representative Gannon so that when their committee, if they have any follow-up with public safety, that you can join in? Do, would you mind, John, if we join in on one of your meetings as well? And um, so I want to thank the commissioner and, and the team for coming in. Uh, right now, we're going to have about five minutes so that I can hear from government operations what their concerns are, um, any policy issues that they want to bring to the table, or if there's any language that they think they need to be working on um, so that we can turn these budgets around as quickly as possible. And you're more than welcome to stay and listen, or you can uh, sign out. I'm not sure where you are, Commissioner Sherling, but it looks a lot better than where any of the rest of us are. <laughs> I, I, you're, you're muted and maybe you want yeah. to be muted. We've all been guessing. I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm in Colchester. <laughs> mm. Oh, good. And enjoy, and enjoy the backdrop. <laughs> um, so you're welcome to stay on. And uh, again, thank Rotary you for being with us. And, uh, I'm not thank you very much. Good to see you all. Thank you. John, um, are there from your committee, um, as we want to, as we start to close out budgets, we want to be aware of some of any of the sticking points. Um, so from you or any of your members, are there things that um, you are going to need to take more testimony on, think about, add language, concerned about a budget reduction or increase? Well, I mean, Commissioner Sherling did note in S219, um, we require all Vermont State Police to wear body cams and that that language needs to be tweaked um, to exclude, you know, folks that are not in the field, um, as he referenced. Um, and that, that will not come through the budget or are you anticipating adding that to the budget, the budget language? Uh, that, that would not be part of the budget, but it would, it would have an impact on the budget because it would reduce the number of body cameras that the State Police need. Um, and so in a memo to us by the first or second, if you could relate that, that you uh, support or don't support, um, if, we, if we could get a memo from you, and it can be a very informal memo. It doesn't have to cite uh, statute or sections in the budget, just you know, cite what the issue is and whether you support it or what the change is that you recommend. Right. Um, and the only other change, um might be tied to whether S54 passes um, and some of the testing requirements um, that are in that with respect to saliva testing um, and blood testing, uh, respect to cannabis um, for highway safety. So those would those would be dealt with in the cannabis bill and not in the budget, correct? Yeah, but I just wanted to just point that out to you. Thank you. Um, anything else budget related? Marsha? Excuse me, Representative Gardner? Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, back to the body cameras. Uh, do we have any idea what the savings will be if not, if all officers do not have to be equipped with body cameras? I think that we have lost, I see uh, Commissioner Sherling is still on. I'm not sure if he's, um, if just, there he is. Yes, I, I lost uh, signal a little bit though. So if there was a question, I missed the content. Representative Gardner? Yes, uh, I'll ask again. Um, because not all of the officers will need body cameras, can you tell me how that will affect the budget? Uh, it would seem that there would be a reduction in the cost to supply everyone with body cameras. I, I wish that were the scenario we were in. We're actually in the inverse that as, as written 219 would, would add cost what we're suggesting is uh, to tweak the language to ensure we don't add any cost. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marcia. That was an important question. And uh, Bob? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd Bob? like to thank the commissioner for not getting us seasick while he's sitting in Colchester. <laughs> um, I, I kind of am in the same ballpark with Jim. Uh, Last year, the storage numbers were prohibitive, and now all of a sudden they seem to be a second thought. So I hope that at least in our committee, we can talk about where that money ended up going or not going. Thank you. We look forward to that conversation. Um, and I'm going to lower my hand. And are there any other final questions? So we will hear uh, more from you. Um, I'm looking Representative Gannon from your committee about tweaking the language regarding those people not working in the field and not needing body cameras, understanding there's not going to be any uh, impact to the budget as Marsha uh, uh, discovered for us. However, please let us know if, if that language needs to end up coming into the budget because we'd need to consider it sooner than later with the yep. type, time yep. schedule. Then that, if the other pieces are, are pieces that you agree with, your committee agrees with, if you could just get us a quick email, send it to Teresa, and she'll make sure to forward it to uh, the entire committee um, if you agree with the reductions and any changes. And don't forget to um, look at any initiatives that were in the January proposal. Okay. Okay, thank hey, you. Uh, I, Mary? I'm sorry, I thought of a question that maybe DPS can answer. My recollection of the governor's budget in January was for the mental health specialist, the one that was going, I think the however many that were going to be there, you had planned on receiving some money from the Department of Corrections to help fund that. Is that still the case? And does DOC know that? I do not think I do not see yeah. commissioner nor I don't either does do you know Rick are you aware of that uh, I do recall that they were going to fund one FTE mm -hmm. um, but I I don't know if if their outlook has changed when so my recollection is when I discussed and there was a transition and there's their commissioner a different commissioner had written the budget versus um, Colonel Baker, uh, that was a surprise to them. And so if you're still counting on that, that probably should be sorted out between DPS and DOC. I believe the commissioners have spoken. So okay. I, I think Alrighty. that they are working that out. Okay, Maida, you, you and Mary, between, <laughs> between DOC and uh, DPS will... We'll find out where we are with that uh, position.